there's a fundamental economic law which has never been contradicted to the best of my knowledge. And that is, if you pay more for something, there will tend to be more of that something available. If the amount you're willing to pay for anything goes up, somehow or other, somebody will supply more of that thing. We have made immoral behavior far more profitable. We have, in the course of the changes in our society, been establishing greater and greater incentives on people to behave in ways that most of us regard as immoral. On each of us separately, we've all been doing it. One of the examples that has always appealed to me along these lines is the example of Great Britain. Not now, but in the 19th century, the 18th century. You know, in the 18th century, Britain was regarded as a nation of smugglers, of law avoiders, of people who broke the law. In the 19th and early 20th century, Britain got the reputation for being the most a law beating country in the world, an incorruptible civil service. Everybody knew about the fact that you couldn't bribe a civil servant in Britain the way you could one in, say, Italy or New York. <laughs> How did that come about? How did a nation of smugglers with no respect for the law get converted into a nation of people obedient to the law. Very simply, by, by, by the laissez-faire policy adopted in the 19th century, which eliminated laws to break. <laughs> if you had complete free trade, if you had complete free trade, as you did after the abolition of the Corn Laws, there was no more smuggling. It was a meaningless term. You were free to bring anything into the country you wanted. You couldn't be a smuggler. It was impossible. If you didn't need a license to establish a business, you didn't need a license to open up a factory, what was there to bribe a civil servant for? The civil servants became incorruptible because there was nothing to bribe them for. Now, of course, these patterns, there's a cultural lag, as you have all learned in your anthropology courses. And these patterns, once they develop, last for a while. But what has been happening in Britain in the last 30 and 40 years is Britain has been moving away from essentially laissez-faire and toward a much more controlled and centralized economy. This reputation for law obedience is disappearing. You've had repeated scandals about ministers of the government, about members of parliament, about civil servants who have been bribed, about the rise in gang warfare and the rest. Why? Because you're establishing an incentive. You've got more laws to break now. It's much more fundamental. When the only laws are those laws which everybody regards as right and valid. They have great moral force. When you make laws that people separately do not regard as right and valid, they lose their moral force. Is there anybody in here who has a moral compunction to speeding? I'm not saying you may not have a prudential objection to speeding. You may be afraid you'll get caught. But does it seem to you immoral to speed? Maybe. If so, you're a small minority. I have never yet found anybody who regarded it immoral, as immoral, to violate the foreign exchange regulations of a foreign country. Here are people who would never dream for a moment of stealing a nickel from their neighbor, who have no hesitancy on manipulating their income tax returns so as to reduce their taxes by thousands. Why? Because the one set of laws have a moral value that people recognize independent of the, law, of the government having passed these laws. The other set do not appeal to people's moral instincts. So I believe, well, let me give you some more examples from the United States. Prohibition of liquor, which was attempted, as you know, had disastrous effects on the climate of law, obedience, and morality. Something which had been legal to buy and drink some alcoholic beverages became illegal and you converted law-abiding citizens into bootleggers. I heard over the 60 Minutes on the program last Sunday night a great story on buttlegging. This has to do with the fact that the New York State tax on cigarettes is very much higher than the tax on cigarettes in the state of South Carolina. So you have people going down to South Carolina and buying the South Carolina low-taxed cigarettes and smuggling it into New York State and uh, uh, forging New York State tax stamps on it and then selling it to uh, 
uh, publicly, a large fraction of all cigarettes sold in New York State are butt legs. Now, there you've provided an incentive for people to break the law, so they break the law. It's like prohibition in a different form. The obvious answer is for New York State to lower its taxes, and you will eliminate butt legging overnight and, and be able to take whatever may be the number of policemen who are devoted to enforcing that kind of thing, you will be able to take them and turn them to useful work. 